כי עפר אתה ואל עפר תשוב. There are few statements of human mortality, more blunt, than Psalm 144. Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Mourners, shocked by this brutal reality, search for comfort for their loss and hope for their future. Many find comfort in that same book of Psalms, a powerful collection of ancient poetic prayers, which are often woven into the rituals of saying goodbye to those who have died. The fundamental premise of the Psalms is that there is a living God, and that God hears and sometimes answers the prayers of the mortal faithful. I'm Tom Diaz. The Psalms have inspired some of my art just as they have inspired legions of artists before me for centuries. Let's take a brief tour of the contours of the Psalms. Then I'll share with you some of the art that I created under their spell. One of the amazing things about the Book of Psalms' modern relevance is that it was written two or three thousand years ago by a handful of the elite elders of a new religion that was just then emerging out of the desert. Perhaps even more amazing is the fact that this book has been adopted into the holy scriptures of all three of the major religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Book of Psalms is an important part of what all three religions regard as wisdom and instruction for a moral life revealed to humanity by a single and all-powerful God. From a religious point of view, this is one of the most interesting intersections in America. We're standing at the intersection of Massachusetts and Wisconsin Avenues on a beautiful spring day in Northwest Washington, D.C. What's interesting about this intersection is that within easy walking distance, there are impressive houses of worship of all three of the religions of the people of the book. Less than a block to the north stands the Episcopalian Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul more popularly known as Washington National Cathedral. A few blocks to the east stand the St. Sophia Greek Orthodox Cathedral and the St. Nicholas Cathedral of the Russian Orthodox. Walk a short distance further to the east and you come to the Islamic Center of Washington, which, when it was built, was the largest mosque in the United States. Then two blocks west of here stands the synagogue of the Washington Hebrew Congregation. The Book of Psalms is important to all three of the faiths embodied in these magnificent houses of worship. And similar impressive religious structures can be found all over the world, from Jerusalem to St. Petersburg, Russia, to Greece and to Cordova, Spain where a Catholic church now stands at what used to be one of the great mosques of Islam. Where did this book come from? How did it get from that ancient desert to places of worship and homes all over the world? And who wrote it? In the traditional orthodoxy of the people of the book, there is only one answer. In this fundamentalist view, the Psalms were written by David, a mighty king who ruled over the united monarchy of Judah and Israel sometime around the year 1000 BCE.
according to the Bible, David was a skilled harp player whose first court job was playing music to soothe the mentally troubled King Saul. Then David earned a place in the line of royalty by killing the Philistine giant Goliath. He is also remembered for his extramarital love affair with Bathsheba, the beautiful wife of Uriah, one of David's own officers. David disposed of this inconvenient rival, Bathsheba's husband, by arranging for his death in battle. According to scripture, David had so much blood on his hands that God would not allow him to build the first temple in Jerusalem. That honor was reserved to Solomon, David's son by Bathsheba, who built the temple in 957 BCE. The Babylonians destroyed the first temple in 586 BCE, and then exiled many of the Israelites to Babylon. Notwithstanding his sometimes ambiguous morality, David is a central messianic figure in both Judaism and Christianity. Both religions believe that the Messiah will, or did, descend from the line of David. Although the Psalms are not part of the Quran, Islam recognizes the Book of Psalms as one of the texts revealed by God before the final revelation of the Prophet Muhammad. This book is called the Zabur of Daud. Some of the Psalms, sometimes, are attributed to other great biblical figures. They include Moses and David's son Solomon, among a few others. But many modern scholars, including archaeologists and some historians, maintain that the Psalms were not written at all by David. Even the historical truth of who David was, what he accomplished, and when he did it, is the subject of fierce debate between advocates of the secular and proponents of the sacred. Descriptions of David's rule range from his being the ideal monarch of a mighty regional power to being a man who was, in the words of one scholar, not much more than a hill country chieftain. These scholars argue that the Psalms were in fact written over a long period of time by the priestly class of the Israelite religion, which later became Judaism. They were a liturgical collection used for worship by the priests. The Psalms were intended to be sung, accompanied by a variety of musical instruments. And they have inspired many great musical compositions. One of the showstoppers is this setting of Psalm 51. These poetic, lyrical hymns embodied the religious convictions, lifestyles, and intellectual conclusions of the Israelite elite. They were, according to modern scholars, neither the product of nor the tools of daily use by the greater mass of illiterate Israelite peasants. 
With the end of temple worship, after the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in 70 CE, the Psalms were gradually transformed into the present collection. Today, they are used not only in the liturgy, but also in individual religious instruction, prayer, and inspiration. There are a number of ways to classify the Psalms, but in general, they fall into three types, hymns praising God, complaints and pleas for help, which are often called laments, and psalms of thanksgiving for divine favor of one sort or another. The psalms abound with references to historical and religious themes of Judaism. Some of these themes include the Exodus from Egypt, the Babylonian exile, and the central role of Jerusalem and the Davidic line. Putting aside questions of religious doctrine, the Psalms clearly demonstrate that the most ancient of people wrestled with the same questions that we ask today. Who are we? How did we get here? And why are we here? Much more could be said about the Book of Psalms. After all, commentators have penned tens of thousands of books, commentaries, articles, annotations, and sermons expounding on the words of the Psalms. And that is about 20,000 words in Hebrew and between 30,000 and 40,000 words, depending on the several English translations. But I'll leave further study of those words to you. Now, I'd like to share a few examples of my art that was inspired by the Psalms. I have been particularly interested in two specific types of psalms, the songs of ascent and the imprecatory psalms. The first of these types is found in Psalms 120 through 134. This series of 15 psalms is known as the songs of ascent and sometimes pilgrim songs in English and Shir Hamatlot in Hebrew. While it is clear that these psalms stand together as a specific subgroup, it is less clear precisely how they were used in temple worship. Some authorities suggest that they were sung by ordinary Israelites on an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But another intriguing possibility is that the number 15, 15 psalms of ascent, corresponds to the number of steps that led up to the central point of worship in the temple. Presumably, a different psalm was sung on each step by the priests as they made their way up to the top of the temple. I've taken five examples from the 15 that I made about the Psalms of Ascent. In Psalm 132, the Lord promises that the sons of the line of David will sit on a throne in Jerusalem, and that this holy place will also be the abode or resting place of God himself. This painting, based on Psalm 132, was intended to capture the structure of the religious order that those promises imply. There is a king, a priestly class to interpret the laws of God, 
scribes to record those laws for the masses and the masses themselves who willingly obey the orders of kings and priests and bring their sacrifices to the temple. Psalm 134 praises those who serve God at night. That nightly service is portrayed here in the form of a scholar or a priest who is wrapped in the starry mantle of the infinite and eternal universe. Psalm 129 laments the cruel injustices done to the Jewish people over history. I have incorporated historical vignettes from the destruction of the first temple and the Babylonian exile down to the modern outbursts of anti-Semitism we are experiencing today. Psalm 130 is a well-known plea for help from God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Here I sought to portray souls crying to God for help and being lifted from their depths of despair. This was actually the first painting that I did in this series. The overall project was inspired by this one song. Finally, Psalm 124 sings praise to a God who allowed a thankful people to escape from the evil designs and snares of their oppressors. One of the images in the psalm is that of a bird escaping from a trap, and I have used that image here. The imprecatory psalms are of an entirely different and, to some, troubling character. A handful of this type are found throughout the book of Psalms. They call upon God to wreak vengeance in often brutal ways upon the enemies of the psalmist. These presumably include enemies of God and often include those who have wronged the Israelite nation. Psalm 69, for example, asks God to wreak havoc on and lay bare the tents and castles of the psalmist's enemies. Psalm 137 is even more harsh. It calls for vengeance upon Babylon and states that, quote, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. For the religious among us, the book of Psalms stands as a beacon of faith. Faith in the power of prayer and faith in the existence of a God who not only listens to those prayers, but has the power to answer them. On the other hand, the expectation that God answers prayers, and selectively at that, inspires skepticism among the secular, some of whom doubt that there even is a God. My own view is that it is not necessary to choose between secular and religious views to appreciate the Book of Psalms. Whatever else one may choose to believe or reject, the Psalms are great poems that speak to all of humanity across centuries of human existence. They raise profound questions of the nature of the universe, of the meaning of our existence within that universe, and of a moral life. These are questions that even the most determined secularist must eventually think about. Who are we? Where did we come from and why are we here?